Hello, and again, welcome to Bit Depth. I'm Santiago Ramones. Across from me is Melissa Wimbish of Outcalls. Yeah, um, it is great to have you back. Um, but I get to ask you more deep and probing questions that no one knows how to answer. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so first of all, um, who are you and what do you do? I am a singer and I sing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's a good question. Who am I? Well, I, I, um, I'm in this band out calls and, mm. uh, that's a big part of, of, uh, my, my schedule and my, my career as a singer is, is learning how to be in a band booking, uh, learning how to promote writing, uh, um, touring, all that, all the, all the stuff that comes with being in a band. Um, I'd say though, that my main hustle is as a classical singer. Yeah. So I, I studied opera and classical singing and, um, you know, the jobs that come with that are typically in the church, like singing in choirs, singing as a cantor, um, it, you know, doing the, the hallmark, uh, services like Easter and Christmas, like those kind of seasons are, are mm -hmm. super busy. And then of course, like, you know, aside from those, uh, sort of all year jobs, you've got your one-offs, um, like working at particular, like festivals, working for a specific opera company. Um, and yeah, I typically will, will work with a company, uh, a few times, maybe just once, depending on how I, depending on what the repertoire is and how I know that company um, mm. and whether or not they program solo singing a lot. You know, for example, like I've, I've worked with Washington Ballet because they happened to do uh, Carmina Burana and they did mm. uh, the Men Mendelssohn's uh, The Dream, which require a soprano, but they don't necessarily always program pieces that require solo singing. So just because you worked with them once or twice doesn't mean you're going to work with them all the time. So anyway, if that sort yeah, of yeah. explains what my schedule looks like it's it's a mix of a lot of things that's uh i mean as far as like i just got out of music school last year and it's like you're doing the exact thing that everyone that is in music school is like oh yes that is what my life will look like uh -huh. uh, <laughs> well, that's, and that's it's what funny. like they hope for well that's that's cool to hear because i i know in the midst of it it doesn't Sometimes, well, at least for me, it doesn't feel like I'm doing, it doesn't feel like I'm, I've really got a career. And when, but when I look back on what I've done, you know, it is a career. It's mm. just that I think a lot of people uh, equate career with, um, with uh, stability. Sure. And it's so not the, it's so not the case. <laughs> yeah. The well, time. if you're stable, maybe you might get bored or something. Uh, yeah, it's true. It's true. Do you do any session work? Like studio I, stuff? Not re not a lot, uh, you know. Of course, without calls. Sure. But um, but no, I didn't. I didn't um, really start recording until I began working without calls. So I don't. Those aren't. That's just not my 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 contacts aren't really mm -hmm. in that world. Although I would, and now that's changing, mm -hmm. and. Um, I would like to do more work like that. And I say that without really knowing exactly what session work looks like for, for singers. I can imagine. Um, but you know, just like anything, uh, that's in the realm of the industry that you're not a hundred percent dialed into. I'm sure that if I got to observe more session work, I'd be like, Oh yeah. Okay. I think I could figure out how to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's definitely something that interests yeah. me but um but no not not um haven't have you have you done in a bunch of session work um no not really i mean because i'm not like enough of a like i'm not a good enough bassist or guitarist or i mean i, I think i am a good enough singer but like yeah. i just hasn't come around to that but also uh session work in oklahoma is uh a lot more sparse uh yeah. <laughs> uh, it's really interesting though when you talk uh, our the bass player that we worked with on our uh, No King EP, actually all of our latest 
singles we've released to Kevin has played, but he is legit. And it's so funny because when we met him, we knew he was awesome, but you don't, he's, he's not the kind of guy who is going to, you know, name drop. But so sure. but as we've gotten to know him, you know, we'll, we'll say, Oh, whatever. We'll be shooting the shit about something. And he'll say, Oh yeah, yeah. Charlie Puth. I, I played on that one song. <laughs> and you're wow. like, what? And it's amazing mm-hmm. because he, the way he talks about the session work that he's done, it's like, Oh yeah, there's, it, it's, there's like this database and they, you know, you go and you see what work is available or sometimes they'll reach out to you and you just, you know, if you have a home studio, you just kind of pluck it out and, and then send it in. And it's amazing how in my head I had it. I have it like as this, you go in the studio, you meet Michael Jackson, you shake his <laughs> pan, and then you like sit down and you guys play and you have a couple of joints and what it's totally not right like that. It's it's definitely a little bit more corporate systematic yeah. experience of like you sign up for a thing and then you play it and then make sure it's in the right format and all that nonsense. Right. But it's still <laughs> got a slap though, which is amazing right. if you can do that without having that in studio experience sure. all the time. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's go to the beginning. How, how did you get started in music? I always wanted to sing. People ask me a, a lot, like, hey, what, what, who is your, who kind of inspired you? And, mm. um, I just remember, I, I don't have a faith necessarily like believing in past lives or anything, but if, if I were to find out in the past life that I, that I was a musician, I wouldn't be surprised because mm-hmm. I just always wanted to do it. And there was Nobody in my family that I knew of um, who was musical. I mean, of course, my grandmother, when she did laundry, she would sing and whatever, like little things around the house. Right. Um, but it wasn't a, 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 it wasn't something that I had, that I had around me. Um, mm-hmm. My dad really wanted me to have uh, piano lessons. He was in the military. So I, I was my first, um, like my formative years up until about third or fourth grade, I was living with various family while he was overseas because I was separated from my mother um, at a young age. That's a whole other story. But anyway, I, sh- I, was a- I was around my grandparents, aunts and uncles, kind of going from house to house. But one of the things he really wanted to happen was for me to get piano lessons. So that happened. I ne- it never stuck. It would be like, you know, I'd go for a couple of months and I don't know, maybe the money would run out or whatever. I I don't really know exactly, but I know it wasn't consistent, but I guess it was enough for me to develop some sort of appreciation or some ear. Um, but the singing was always like something I wanted to do, but I think I kept it a secret for a really long time because there wasn't anybody I could really talk to in my family about it. So, um, I, I, uh, I I have these memories of whatever situation I was in at school, I would find a way to have an audience and I would sing to them. I would sing whatever <laughs> Disney song was popping at the time. Or, you know, I remember singing like a prayer by Madonna a couple of times, like acapella, just whatever, like sure. singing for whoever I could probably against their will at a playground somewhere. Um, and then in, uh, when it was time to like pick your band instrument, I, I picked saxophone. Um, <laughs> I don't know why I didn't, go to, into choir or anything like that. I guess I was still just too shy, but then mm. by high school I had played in enough pit bands and you know, the musical pit to, to, I guess, um, lose some of my, uh, shyness. Mm-hmm. And I auditioned for the musical in high school, which is always the big deal. Right. Right. And, uh, the first year that I auditioned, I was cast in the chorus and the second year I got the lead role, which at that time in my life was like the biggest thing that could have happened. <laughs> and it was, I just remember that being a turning point for me. Um, of course, coupled with, with the voice teacher that I met in high school who was giving free voice lessons. And I waltzed in one day and said, Hey, I heard you're giving free lessons. Let's see, let's, let's see what you got. <laughs> yeah. Um, so a combination of those things, just having, having a great teacher, having this, um, this innate sort of like, Need. rabid feeling. Yeah. I just yeah. had to sing, just always had to. And I'm lucky that I, that I had the right teachers that, uh, that built my voice because I grew up in Kansas and there wasn't a lot of choice there. You know, you <laughs> didn't, you know what I'm saying? Like you didn't mm-hmm. sound like, Oh, I'm going to study with this teacher that there was one teacher. And, mm-hmm. uh, I, I was just lucky that she was a great teacher. Yeah. 
What was that lead role, if I may ask? It was Polly and Crazy for You. Mm. <laughs> yeah, a bunch of Gershwin. It was really fun. Nice. Um, so I guess one of the things I do kind of ask musicians is like, how did you decide it was what you wanted to do? But then for you, since it is more just like you were always in that trajectory, how, I guess, since it was kind of a secret for you, mm -hmm. how did that sort of manifest as you are leaving high school? And yeah, that's a good question. I remember wanting to study theater and not I mean, I wanted to sing, but when it was time to make the decision of what you're going to major in, I wanted to major in theater. And somehow that morphed into musical theater. So mm -hmm. when, I, when I auditioned and applied for schools, I would audition for the musical theater program. But by kind of default, you were still considered for the classical program because a lot of the, these were, the, at least the schools that I applied to, which were I can't even remember that weren't, they weren't a lot. I knew I wanted to go to Colorado because my boyfriend at the time was in Colorado. So that was, yeah, really <laughs> awesome decision-making on my part based your school on where your boyfriend is, but whatever, it all worked out. <laughs> anyway, I ended up auditioning for these places and wanting to be in the musical theater program, but was denied for every musical theater program and accepted for the classical program. So mm -hmm. I was like, fine, fuck it. I'll sing opera for a year and then I'll get better and I'll do musical theater but then it ended up, you know, the opposite. <laughs> I fell in love right. with, with the style and, um, you know, building my voice in that way was, yeah. was really, and of course I, I made friends and I learned more about what, what the art form was and what it, it, it encompassed. And I loved singing in choirs. I remember really, um, you know, be, becoming obsessed with choir <laughs> and being, mm -hmm such a nerd about that and like then of course there was like a jazz ensemble I just wanted to sing everything uh mm -hmm. so yeah I got I guess I got I got hooked after after have, kind of being forced into the opera community <laughs> right um and that that kind of happens a lot also with like the instruments that people play it's like oh mm -hmm. I just they just needed this instrument and now I'm just like the best one at it <laughs> <laughs> you needed this and now I'm the best right uh, <laughs> um, I've actually, I've warned other musicians about majoring in performance. Yeah. Uh, if they like, didn't have the drive to like work to be the best. Could you yeah. describe that drive in you? <laughs> oh my God. It's, I'm sure this description is going to make some people roll their eyes and that's fine. But I just, it's like, I can't escape it. I can't mm. not do it. And I'm good, you know, like, you know, when you're good <laughs> and you're not good, like it, if there's some things where I'm like, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to be good at that. And I'm not going to do the work to get good at that. And that's okay. For me, singing has been like, I'm going to fucking do this. I love this so much. And then, you know, of course now when we're all, so many of us artists can't do what we do the way we were doing it before, the way that my, that I'm that I am because of the fact that I can't really do what I've been doing is I can tell like that. I, can't, you know, you, you sit down and kind of think, okay, well, what can I, what else can I do? I mean, I have to decide to do something else probably like what if, what if performing isn't possible for another couple of years? Am I just going to sit and <laughs> do a shitload of push ups and read books or am I going to try to do something else, whatever that something else is. And my something else is going to have to be as close to singing and performing as I can get, you know, I just mm -hmm. can't, I need it. Right. And I even have this backup plan. Cause I'm, I'm totally that person who walks into a room and is like, how can I escape from here? If sure. all the walls fall in, you know? So I have a plan for like, if a bobcat comes and claws out my larynx, like what, how am I going to still perform? Mm -hmm. You know, I, those are, uh, so that's, that's what it is. for Yeah. Me. Yeah. It's that actually, uh, brings me to a similar question, which is like, for me as a singer as well, I feel like my vocal range is a part of my identity. Uh -huh. Like, Oh, I'm a tenor. I sing high. Like, do you feel like if you lost your range, you would somehow not be you? Oh, totally. Not. <laughs> nope. I, I used to obsess about that shit because I'm mm. a coloratura soprano and a coloratura is expected to sing these super high notes, like very, very high queen of the night kind of shit. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, it, it, I've been told so many times, like 
do this rep, you, this rep would be perfect for you. And I just don't want to, I just, just don't want to. I mean, of course I've sung high rep and I, I don't shy away from, uh, from learning how to best use that part of my, my range, but I've always wanted to use my entire voice and not be made to feel like if I can't sing color or tour rep better than everybody else, that that's the only thing I can do. You know? Sure. Um, so no, I think if I lost half of my range, I would still find a way. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what are some of your biggest influences in music? Uh, well, it's hard to narrow them all down, I, but the biggest ones first are Ella Fitzgerald, because mm. I remember one of the first gigs I got was singing this USO show. It was a, a throwback and we're designing a USO show to, to sing for all these veterans. And I had to learn a bunch of jazz standards and I hadn't done a ton of jazz. So mm. I just listened to Ella Fitzgerald. Like I became obsessed immediately. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I found out that we shared a birthday, which sounds kind of like, okay, whatever. That's a quick Google search, but I'm a child of the eighties and nineties and we didn't have that information like Googleable <laughs> right away. So when I found out after having fallen in love with her singing for, for a very long time, it was like, oh my God, this is a gift. <laughs> you know, we have <laughs> the same birthday. Um, Elle Fitzgerald, Jesse Norman, the first, the first CD I was ever given of a, of a recital of any sort was Jesse Norman and oof, like my hair is standing up just thinking about <laughs> how that felt and hearing her. Um, and then of course you got like Whitney, Mariah, uh, um, the little mermaid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I loved, I fell in love with John Frashani's uh, guitar playing. He's the, mm. uh, he was the, he is now again, the guitarist of the chili peppers, but he's kind of been in and out. Um, but I loved, I just loved his playing and I loved his story because uh, when I was introduced to his music, I first heard some of the albums that he did when he was just like on heroin, like <laughs> just on heroin. And I thought, what the fuck is this guy doing? With Because he was singing a lot and, and playing guitar. And then to hear the work that he began to put out as he got sober and then the work he's done with the Chili Peppers and just his whole journey as an artist is so fascinating to me. And his voice might some would consider like not pretty or kind of weird, but I am just so obsessed with the way he writes lyrics mm -hmm. and the way he uses his voice. His mother is an opera singer too, which I find <laughs> I find so fascinating. Um, so he's been a big influence. I love his yeah. playing. I just love his playing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, funny thing about, um, well, I don't normally go into like stories while the interview, but like uh, I got to meet, Jody Benson, since you mentioned uh -huh. Little Mermaid, and uh -huh. um, she's just the nicest person. Oh, of course, of course. <laughs> yeah, like she she's just a, a living Disney princess, is what she oh. is. So yeah, um, and she uh, she had like a panel at that convention or something, and she sang uh -huh. "Part of Your World," and I cried. Oh, so, like it. That's yeah. all. She's great. It's, that's <laughs> <all>. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways. <Icon>. Um, <laughs> Um, so I think she sang oh, the lead. I think she sang the lead in the crazy for you. Um, she sang Polly in crazy for you, which I found hmm. out later. Um, <laughs> you know, like, I think I might've listened to a recording and not put two and two together that she had also been the little mermaid. So that probably blew my mind at the time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so since a lot of your work co does come from a uh, classical world, um, I guess why, opera like why yeah. or why that style and why did that stick with you it like I like I mentioned before it wasn't really a choice that I consciously made it was just um this teacher her name was Mandy Adams and um when I when I waltzed into the the uh choir studio at Junction City High School and said, Hey, I heard you're giving free lessons. She sort of took the reins and she, she knew what, what I wanted. She knew my goal was to get a lead in the musical. Like that mm. I was like, this is what I want to do. I, you know? Um, but she said, cool, we're going to work on that. And we're also going to work on this song, which is like, you know, your traditional art song. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I think she really guided me towards that rep and I gained so much confidence singing that rep. And then of course, when I, like I said, again, uh, when I auditioned for stuff and they were like, we want, we want you to sing opera. You're, you're more, uh, your voice is just better suited for that rep. Of course, like I didn't want to do it, but hearing that you're good at something, of course, I mean, come on, we're we're all humans with egos. We're like, cool. I'm going to do more of that and see where that goes. So I just eventually started to understand why, uh, why I was getting that feedback because Mm -hmm. it was easier. It was, it's not that it's easier to sing that way, but it was easier for my instrument to do that Mm -hmm. stuff. It like felt natural. And, um, yeah. And then whatever, you just continue to get feedback. You continue to learn more and you become fascinated. And that's, Mm -hmm. that's what I, I think I've used the word fascinated 25 times, (laughs) but I just, I just became really obsessed with getting Mm -hmm. very good. And there were so many great singers around me. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I think I was just in such a great environment to, to become obsessed with, with it. And, and, um, you know, it's like, uh, if, if people want to learn how to move their bodies or dance, you, I mean, you probably start with some basic like ballet. Yeah. Right. So it's like, I I think I looked at opera that way, or I know I did. Like, I've got to learn how to sing in the best possible way in the most efficient way. And then it will translate to anything else I want to do. And it has, and it has. Cool. Um, I guess a little bit of a like technical question. Uh, do women have falsetto? I think, I think the answer to that is yes. We just, <laughs> we just call it our head voice. Mm-hmm. I think the word falsetto comes from the word false, right? Mm-hmm. Like, so men or you know, I don't know if that's the correct thing to say. People, male voices uh, mm-hmm. that are, I guess, t- they tend to be lower voices and in, in a male body. Mm-hmm. Uh they it, they have to access that that register of their voice in a way that it doesn't necessarily feel uh, it doesn't feel natural or it's not like full, the, right? <laughs> right, it's not full, and it, so I guess the fullest part is typically your chest and your mix, and then the falsetto can be this really airy sort of yeah fake yeah. fake fake soprano <laughs> voice. Sure. Whereas for women, like uh, that part of our voice can be like our strongest Mm -hmm. but i don't know i'm not i'm not a pedagogue in that way right no i mean and that's just something that i've been curious for a while because i i like my falsetto and i've always kind of wondered how that translates because i've had like girl students before yeah and i'm like i don't know how to explain this you know (laughs) some 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 men who have a falsetto and love to sing in it get really awesome at it and they then they are uh, i mean they can I've heard some of the best falsetto from men mm. and like people that like runs and getting their falsetto so strong that they can sing soprano arias, mezzo arias. And mm. I don't know how that it like, I, I've heard that you can make a choice if you want to be like a counter tenor, if you can sure. strengthen that part of your voice, then you, you could. Uh, yeah. I, again, I'm not a pedagogue. So somebody hearing this that actually knows this stuff might, might be um have have more to say but (laughs) yeah Yeah. anyway i think but it's important for guys to strengthen their falsetto if you can strengthen your falsetto you get so much ease in the rest of your voice Mm -hmm. um and other kind of more technical type stuff uh what is your favorite language to sing in if it isn't english french Mm, why i love singing french (laughs) because I'm good at it. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, that's right. You want to do things you're good at and they're your favorite things are the things that feel natural and singing Mm. in French, even though I don't speak it at all. Uh, it feels very natural. It Mm. seems like it's always been the easiest one for me to imitate. And Mm. I, I love French singers, Canadian French singers. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I love, I love so much of the French repertoire too. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah but i love i love singing in french yeah i as a native spanish speaker i hate french and really? <laughs> and having had to like learn how french works uh-huh. like i i get it yeah. but 
it's so weird. <laughs> it is weird. It is weird. There's so many rules, but then it, you know, you do it so much that it gets, it gets a lot easier. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would never say it's easy. It's, it's definitely takes a lot of work. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think is the like fascination with old music in classical world? Ugh. Like we have hundreds of new composers nowadays, but right. like we're still singing 200 year old operas. I think it's laziness. <laughs> I think it's just fucking laziness. You know, there are so many great old works. Fine. You know, <laughs> do, do them occasionally do them, do them whenever it's appropriate, I guess. But the, the fact that it's, it, that they are, they're basically used to sell tickets now. And that's very sad because it, it can work. That can work for a very long time until it doesn't. And that's where mm-hmm. we're at right now. Yeah. <laughs> you know? and uh yeah i so i didn't really answer the question I, yeah laziness I, I stick with that i think people are are lazy and there are too many folks that are in charge of programming and in charge of organizations that have have that do not have imaginations and mm. they and people don't have confidence in audiences they think mm-hmm. they know their audience and they think that when one thing with an audience works, that that's what they've got. They've got to make that the template for the rest of the shit they do for all existence. So it's leader, it's bad leadership. It's lack of imagination. It's lack of, um, diverse voices. It's, Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you have, have a whole, if you have a board of old white men, they're going to continue to program old white men. That's Mm -hmm. just, yeah, that's it. And the marketing, oh my God, marketing teams don't even get me started. (laughs) <laughs> what's what's the aria that you're like tired of singing for the hundredth time <laughs> oh. i you know i've i'm lucky in that i've done so much i've kind of been pigeonholed in in modern and contemporary work so mm. i haven't really had the stuff when i get when i sing operatic work it's it's usually a breath of fresh air i don't ever i've never been like uh I've never had played out any arias. I mean, of course we've all sung Omiya Babino Kato a million times, but, (laughs) um, but I still, it's a beautiful aria and I get why people love it and want to hear it. Yeah. So I, I haven't, I haven't had to do a ton of traditional opera stuff. And when I do it, it's usually uh, again, fine. Breath of fresh air. (laughs) Yeah. Um, how do you feel about, uh, contemporary classical where we're at now? with modern composers? I, I know so little about it. I, I realize, I realize when I, when I scroll through, scroll through Twitter or, um, you know, especially the new music hashtag or looking at, you know, the, the new music, uh, gatekeepers. Mm-hmm. And I, you, you take a look at a few of their, I don't know, a few of their threads and it makes me realize like how much I don't know. I feel very dialed out mm-hmm. of the scene. I know what I like, of course. And I know a few people, um, a few composers who are, who are standing out and who are doing really well, but I just don't know the scene, uh, in and out like some people do. Um, but my impression is that the new music community is really trying to do all the shit that I just complained about when we talked about (laughs) old rep, they're trying to change the course of, of the, of the industry. And I, but there, you know, that that being said, I still see hints of those same tropes, you know, in the in the new music community, and they just have to be aware. I think we we all have to be aware that just because our hope is to end some of that bullshit, we are still susceptible to it. And I see a ton of, you know, new music coming from white male composers. That's wonderful that they have something to say, but are we just creating the same version? Yeah. you know again are, are mm-hmm. we are we doomed to repeat history yes we are if we don't insist and and protect and uh lift up composers of color women um you know all the marginalized voices in our community and also program uh, uh hiring hiring of artists and creative teams yeah um what that kind of extends into the next question which is like where would you like to see the industry move towards? 
I'd love to see, I'd love to see the, um, well, you know, what, are we ever going to see the days of a packed metropolitan opera house? Probably not. And people have lost taste for the Met. Oh my God. You know, the way they have even handled this crisis with, with the, the choices they've made for streaming, it's just, they're, they're done. I, I mm. think, I think they, I mean, they were done before, but I feel like they've just, they really, um, they really fucked up. So I, I wonder if those, those days of the, of the giant crowds and, um, and the grand opera, if they're over, if they're finally mm. over. And if they, if they are, I don't know that I'm, that I care too much about that. Of course, it's a wonderful sight to behold, uh, mm. but it does it have to be, does it have to drive the business? Does it have to drive the art form so much? I don't think so. Um, mm. I'd love to see some of the most amazing productions I've done have been in like black box theaters. I love that. I love that so much. And I feel like it's more fulfilling. Yeah. Um, I feel so much more uh, connected to the audience, connected to the stories that are being told. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to see more of that. Things like the prototype festival. Mm -hmm. Um, of course I'm only naming the things that I know of. I know there are dozens more things out there. Sure. Um, yeah. Um, and then how does technology impact the work that you're doing? Uh, well, I guess it will become more and more a thing I have to at least develop language, um, mm -hmm. about, uh, right now I don't, I feel, I, I totally feel behind, like going in the studio, I've learned a ton of, I have how to communicate with engineers. And that, so I'm thankful for that. I, I, I know I have some knowledge, but for, you know, for example, Britt and I were asked to do a live stream with a, with a company that I think is legit. I mean, they're going to, they're going to market the performance. They're going to, they're going to promote everything and uh, they're going to provide us with some tools. They're not just saying, Hey, make us a video and send it in. You know, we're going to have, mm. we're going to, we're going to have help. Um, but I feel like that expectation for people to show like they, they're going to have to have the resources to show what they can do without anybody without any like production company or without a theater. And, um, and it's intimidating to think about that. Yeah. I don't know if I answered the question. No, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> so te technology is becoming more and more a part of how we're going to, as artists that, that we're going to survive this, I mm -hmm. guess. Yeah. Um, what's something that people don't normally know about you? Oh man. Hmm. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I think people would probably be surprised to hear that I obsess about conversations I have. Like if I'm mm -hmm. at a show um, and I ran into somebody that like, I don't know, is in another band that I've seen or is a fan of my band and, or I don't know, a friend of a friend, I always feel like I am the most awkward, you know? And like, mm. maybe I talked about something super weird or I made them feel weird or I made a bad joke or I said something offensive. <laughs> so I like, I just obsess about my interactions with people after the fact, like a sure. lot. <laughs> so, so much that I've had to work on it and be like, Melissa, girl, nobody fucking cares. Like they probably forgot, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. No, I feel like as like musicians and performers that there's probably a, a huge level of anxiety that just comes from like interacting with people and be like, oh, well, th I have to reflect my personality from yeah. stage and with interpersonally. And yeah, total. Like I feel <laughs> I think for me, it's it's not it's just that in my effort to be myself and just be chill, <laughs> I have no chill. <laughs> and I also want people to feel valued. And sometimes I think I obsess about that way too much. And mm. so like, so to where it might come across as fake. <laughs> so of course, like, you know, yes, I've given this a lot of thought. I'm just trying, I'm trying to have more chill. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
what advice do you have for other professional singers starting out? Hmm. Keep going. Keep going. Keep getting better. Try not to give a fuck. <laughs> be kind. Be gracious. Guard your time. Yeah. Get sleep. <laughs> Eat well, take care of yourself. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> have, and just have good people around you. Mm. Just really, that's, and that's hard work. It's really hard work. Yeah. Uh, switching gears, and there's no way to transition to it. Uh, <laughs> what is the role of spirituality or religion in your life? Well, I have to be around a lot of it because I, as a singer, you know, you've got to be, if you want to work mm -hmm. consistently, you've got to sing for the church. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's funny. I grew up trying so hard to believe in Jesus. Like <laughs> I have a, a really embarrassing story too, which is, um, I, well, it's embarrassing for me. Maybe, maybe people who are like <laughs> Uber Jesus will think it's wonderful, but I, I was in this thing called girl state. Have you ever heard of this thing where it's, mm -hmm. it happens in high school, I think where you, you go to, you basically go play government with a bunch of people. It's like a camp, but it's government. And for me, it was all girls and it was at Kansas state university. And, uh, yeah, we stayed, I think we stayed in the dorms, but yeah, we would, we like, we basically voted in Congress people, senators, whatever. Anyway, I was assigned or I was voted to be the a journalist or something. And I had to report the news uh, this is all kind of slowly coming back to me because I probably blocked it out with embarrassment. <laughs> but I remember I had the mic at some event at, that, that was part of the camp and there were hundreds of girls in the audience and somebody had died in a fire the night before. I don't remember who, but I, it might've been somebody that connected with the, the organization. Anyway, everybody was sad about it. And I remember getting on the mic and being like, fucking come to Jesus. Jesus will save you. Like this is now, now is the time, you know, when things like this happen, we've got to, we've got to look to Jesus. <laughs> and I look back on that. If I had, if I could get in a time machine and take back one thing on my life, it would be that fucking thing. <laughs> Cause, I can't, Cause like, no, I mean, wonderful. If you believe in Jesus, great. I am fascinated with Jesus. Like I mm -hmm. love watching shit like the 10 commandments and Ben Hur and of course, like I hear the readings all the time and there's totally stuff you can learn from it, from it, the Bible. Uh, but I don't know. I, I think I spent, I spent so much time trying to believe in God and in Jesus. And, uh, I just don't, but what I will say is the music is popping. I love the intent. And I think people who have religion and, um, and spirituality in their life are better for it. And I could, I, if I can find a way to take some of those elements in my life that I can believe in, I'm going to continue to try to work on that stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's how I feel <laughs> about that. <laughs> uh, running sound for a church. I, I, I feel the same thing too. Like I can't turn the voice off in my head. That's just uh -huh. like, Ugh. I know. You know? <laughs> I know. Well, because I, you know, I, and I sing, I'm a cantor at a Catholic church. Mm -hmm. And so of course, like with all of the abuse in the church and the cover ups and all that stuff. I mean, I remember going to uh, sing on a Sunday after the news had broken uh, the, the, the news out of Philly, you know, that mm -hmm. big scandal. Yeah. Yeah. And just being like, and I remember the person who preached that day was like, Oh God, it just complicit, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And I felt like the sermon was, it was like an attack on the congregation. Like, oh yeah, this shit is really wrong that happened, but you know, don't lose faith in God. If any of you guys are losing faith in God, fuck you. And I was like, <laughs> what the fuck? You should be saying, you should be like thankful people are even here right now and comforting people right now. So I have, I have a lot of issues with, <laughs> with the Catholic church. Um, and you know, maybe one of these days I'll just be like, fuck it. I can't go back. I, it, this is just too much. Uh, but again, it all, it all is rooted in something good. And I do think people are trying to do something good. So we'll see. And I need that check, you know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> definitely. Um, <laughs> so with, with that, uh, what is your definition of God? Ooh, 
that the feeling of not knowing when the fuck things started, like when you try to think back as far as you can, and then your stomach does that thing where it like <laughs> turns on itself. Yeah. <laughs> that. Yeah. <laughs> my grandmother used to say, my grandmother used to say, God's so deep. You can't go under him. He's so wide. You can't go around him. And so tall. You can't go over him. And I was like, girl, you got to find some new pronouns for God. But other than that, I think it's a solid yeah. thing. That that also sounds like a really good yo mama joke. <laughs> <laughs> it does. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. Um, <laughs> it, <laughs> it's so hard really to like <laughs> go into the <laughs> go to the next one. Um is free will an illusion how or how is it not <laughs> oof damn philosophy don't know yeah free sorry will. no no it's okay <laughs> I, I love i love questions that make me realize that i don't know shit <laughs> um yeah i think i'd like to think so i'd like to think so like believe in free will yeah yeah <laughs> um Okay. Uh, how do you determine what good behavior is, you godless heathen? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I'm still learning, because I've I've not I've not always been um, a good behavior. Um, so I think I'm still learning, but I it probably would would say it's a, more of a feeling and, 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 and also learning, you know, learning from, from books, learning from people, learning from conversations, uh, learning from people who don't look like you. Um, yeah, it take. I think it's good behavior. It, it takes a lot of work. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh-huh. I always appreciate more of the humble answers rather than just like, here's a textbook. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, how do we reduce the division? Uh, reduce our egos. Mm. Yeah. I think. <laughs> um, and then how do you live with or against the selfishness that pervades American culture? Mm. speaking of egos <laughs> I yeah I tr- I just try to I try so hard to know when I'm being judgy like and I mean of course you gotta immerse yourself in the tea when when you do you know you gotta let yourself complain and um and uh, yeah I think you gotta you gotta let yourself complain and be ugly around you know the people it's safe to be that with and people who will tell you about yourself. And it, it, hopefully that made sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think that's important. And then I also feel like you have to f- work very, very hard to hope. Yeah. You have to just, it's not, it doesn't come easy. I mean, it might come easier for some people, but I, it's for, it's day to day for me. It's, it's uh, minute by minute. Yeah. I always feel like it it is a really hard line to walk, uh, being a musician, making stuff and like balancing the ego of like, like, Hey, you should listen to my stuff. I'm the greatest. Uh, but also like, I'm, I'm not, please don't. (laughs) Right. Uh, Right. How do you kind of walk that line? Yeah. 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 Well, again, it's, um, I think it's, uh, it takes practice. It takes practice and, uh, and you have to make a conscious decision to like to be to figure out what's right and do it and like not expect it's going to come naturally Mm -hmm. to you you know like I remember there was there was only one singer I think I've ever been jealous of in my entire life I was so I was just I mean I loved her singing and she's dead now sadly um but I remember just like making the decision that I was going to try to learn everything I could from her 
And in the process of doing that, I mean, it was hard. It was hard to say, how do you breathe? Or how do you think of singing to ask that question? But the minute I did, it's like the jealousy was gone, you know? And I think, uh, that's such an important thing as musicians, like there's always going to be somebody better than you and you have to, you have to really work on how to, how to get over that shit because we all have our, we all have something um, special about us and we're also all not special. (laughs) So yeah, um, yeah, I think that's really important, but all these things, it all comes back to being willing to do, to take that step and do the work and to do, the thing that exposes your weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Kind of going with that, do you separate art from the artist? Yeah, I do. I, I think sometimes it's, it's such a personal thing. I always, Mm. I always uh, make this comparison, which I might regret, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, (laughs) I grew up watching the Cosby show and I loved the Cosby show and Bill Cosby and everything about him. I cannot even stomach a Bill Cosby skit right now. If somebody were to play one for me. Um, in fact, I went to a Bible study. Can you believe it? I don't believe in God or Jesus or anything. (laughs) I keep saying Jesus. Like I got to make sure I say both of them. Um, (laughs) uh, but I went to a Bible study because I thought, why not? You know, I'll go. The Bible's interesting. And one of the first things that this woman played was a Bill Cosby skit about Noah's Ark. And this was not that long ago. It was like a year ago. I was like, girl, what the fuck? Where mm. this isn't funny. Uh you know, you don't you don't find this you don't find this like hard to stomach. And she's like, Oh no, I mean we grew up. I mean, what he did was disgusting, but you know, it's still funny. No, can't do it. However, <laughs> Michael Jackson, you put on a Michael Jackson song and I'm, I'm just like enthralled. Do I have Michael Jackson posters up in my house? No, but there's something about Michael Jackson and the, his story that I like, I pity, I'm so sad and I'm still sad for any of the, I believe his victims. Absolutely. I also see him as a victim and there's something about that. And I don't know why, I don't know why that I can still listen to Michael Jackson and not be totally disgusted. But Bill Cosby, I just am like, fuck him. He can rock, you know? So that, that being said, I think it's a very personal thing. And, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, name a few artists and I'll tell you yes or no Wagner. Fuck. I don't care. I'm sorry. I don't care. (laughs) He, he, his anti-Semite, I just am not interested in, di- in diving down the Wagner. I mean, maybe I'll hear some Wagner and not know it and be like, that's beautiful, but I'm not going to go seek Wagner out, you yeah. know? Also, it's like nobody needs a like 12 hour long oh, thing anyway. So nobody it's, it's not fine. anymore. We got, we got, <laughs> we got Netflix now, son. <laughs> we don't got need, more important things to do. We don't do. need your 12 hour opera. <laughs> we got Lord of the Rings too. We can just watch the extended version. Yeah. <laughs> I actually watched that recently with my wife. Yeah, so. I was just talking about it yesterday with my with with Brit and uh, saying like, "Oh, I just love it. it's such a comfort movie." Yeah. <laughs> um, this is sort of a, a weird, cheesy question, uh, and I haven't asked it in a while. But can music save the world? Oh, yeah. I don't know. Um, no, it can't. <laughs> we need leaders. We need leaders. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, can and those then, wait, leaders and then maybe be for musicians? <laughs> yeah, leaders. <laughs> leaders can be musicians. I. I yeah. But no, we need leaders, and then we the music. We can play the music at the after party. Sure. <laughs> but no, I I I know it, maybe if it was a smaller world, mm. but it's just yeah, we got to think bigger. I think. Yeah. I just watched Arrival yesterday, so it's probably a terrible time to ask that question. <laughs> Have you seen that movie? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, I guess speaking of, I don't know, the future, uh, <laughs> what are you optimistic about for our future? When I 
just take a, a moment to actually listen to something good that's being made or a good conversation um, instead of instead of uh, zoning in on all the shit that's wrong with the world. I mean, not to discount any of that because it's very important. Um, but when I, when I really listen to things people are saying who want to fix shit and who want to put beauty into the world, I'm all, it's always a renewal for me. And I think as long as those voices are sought out, then, you know, we have a chance. We have a, we have a fighting chance to, you know, survive until the sun explodes. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll see if we get that far. Uh, right. <laughs> uh, do you believe humans are evil by nature? No, no. More of a blank slate sort of thing or good. Do you believe humans are good? <laughs> hmm. I'd, I'd be interested to read more about that from like a, a chemical perspective. Cause I know there are things that happen with people, you know, or I don't know, but you know, we hear that, you know, some people are more prone to behaving in this manner because of whatever chemical thing in their brain or who knows. Um, mm. But in my, in my experience, I, I, I would say, like if I was talking to an extraterrestrial about humans, I would say that I think they want to be good. Yeah. <laughs> they want um, to survive. I mean, survival, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> and hopefully we can design an environment to where good behavior causes survival. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I think, what, well, yeah. And what is good, what is good behavior compared to survival? I, I guess it's, I mean, the, you're, you're inspired, you're, affected by what's around you mm -hmm. and i guess the more good that's around or what you know, the yeah. more produ productivity and yeah <laughs> trying to better the world that's around you the more it becomes part of your society exactly oh. um what makes you content oh god i wish i knew <laughs> um you know i the being outside it's especially the the ocean, even though I'm terrified of like crashing into the ocean, going too far out into the ocean, anything that's in the ocean. I don't want <laughs> anything to do with any of that, but I love being there. I love being there. And I feel like if I was going to die somewhere, I'd want it to be like standing on the beach and then just the just giant tidal wave comes <laughs> and destroys everything. Not, uh, you know, that's kind of insensitive to say, because I, I don't mean it like that in like this romantic way um because i know it's terrifying but there's something about the the being by the water that really calms me it just feels it feels like um very natural yeah <laughs> um when will you be satisfied <laughs> probably when i'm dying <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah i don't know i don't i don't know if i can answer that i have no idea i hope it's soon <laughs> hope it's sure soon. um all right i have like three more questions yeah. uh it seems like an attack but i just think it's a funny question to ask what's the point yeah well of you do you mean like of everything or just of being a yeah musician? probably in general <laughs> okay um it depends i guess like for me the point is is uh existing like i mm -hmm. i just can't i think my i blame my father because my father is like he can't sit his ass down <laughs> he's, he's retired and he got a part-time job because like that's retirement to him as a part-time job where he gets mm. like three thirty in the morning and goes and he works at a golf course and, and then he comes home and does more housework and he's just, he's going all the time. Yeah. And, uh, but I, I guess I've seen what happens when he doesn't do that because he, he was injured. 
Um, but by being up in a fucking tree with the chainsaw and he wasn't harnessed in and he got really like badly injured. He's fine now. But I saw, I like got a glimpse of what he was like during that time. And it was like, Whoa, you I think, like, you'll, you'll, you'll die if you don't like get back to doing something soon. Yeah. So I think I'm just one of those people. And that's one of the, one of, one of those people who's got to do stuff and I've got to do this very specific thing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, what advice do you have for people in general? Think about space more. Hmm. <laughs> Every time I think about space, I am like, yeah, I just am like, fuck it. Don't worry about anything. That's actually really good. <laughs> That's a, yeah. Can you elaborate a little bit more? Cause that, I don't know like, if I what, can. How does I that? It, <laughs> it becomes less profound the more I elaborate. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's like what, it's kind of the opposite of what I was talking about before. If you think back all the way to the beginning and that feeling mm-hmm. of God, just being like, whatever your stomach does, mm-hmm. it's like, could now do the opposite. And you know, you have, we watch fucking the planets or whatever the hell, or it was Cosmos, and you're mm-hmm. like, holy shit, that's how big the Milky Way is? Yeah. What the fuck? Yeah. Why am I worried about my student loans? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, of course, we are worried, and there's much shit to worry about here on Earth, and it's fucked up. Uh, the injustices that are just ingrained into our into our society, but then at the same time, it all really doesn't mean that much. Mm. So I think it's important to deal with the world we're in, of course, but every once in a while when it becomes so so overwhelming that it it is like crippling, you've got to have a way out. And for me that sometimes that way out is like thinking about space. Yeah, definitely. I like that a lot. Uh, Last one, cake or pie. Mm. Well, is, does quiche count as pie? Um, See, this is the kind of person I am. You ask me, what, what would you rather? And I'm going to find a way. Sure, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I've. this is the final question in the podcast, so I've talked about this a lot. Okay, like, <laughs> let's hear it. Let's hear the spiel. So all right, well, so I mean, generally, cake has like the, the airy, like bready type stuff with like icing on top and then pie has like a crust and then like a filling that and like that's the majority of the flavor so like uh, cake cake definitely yeah (laughs) cake cake definitely pie you know here i can't handle cooked fruit (laughs) and pie is normally cooked fruit Hmm. just can't can't handle it it's too mushy sure too mushy yeah i appreciate that (laughs) uh what is best cake then oh definitely like chocolate devil's food chocolate Mm. chocolate (laughs) yeah beautiful or 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 like the yellow cake with chocolate icing that's Mm -hmm. also delicious yeah Yeah, i think actually i'm gonna i'm gonna say yellow cake with with chocolate icing sweet yeah (laughs) uh melissa thank you for doing this with me thank you (laughs) it was was really nice to to talk one-on-one yeah um, where can we find you and your stuff and all the outcall stuff and all the everything? Outcallsband.com for everything outcalls related. There's links to our music. Um, and then I've got my personal website, melissawimbish.com, which has yeah. links to nothing because nothing is happening. But you'll <laughs> see some great pictures that Britt took and <laughs> some of my past work. And hopefully there'll be upcoming things at some point in the future. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and not to you, but to whoever's listening is, is like, listen to out calls. They're really good. Oh it's yeah. Really good. It's banging. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, all of your favorite artists were once local artists. So yeah, do it. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, well, yeah. Uh, thank you so much. I'm Santiago. Thank you, Ramones. Santiago. It's really nice to be here. <laughs> um, and then, well, I guess I'm Santiago Ramones. You say your name. <laughs> I'm Melissa Wimbish. You can find everything that I do on my website, SantiagoRamones.com. 
I have an album that is now out. It is called Bloom. It is streaming everywhere, or you can buy it on Bandcamp for $10 and get that tasty bonus track. So put on that album in the background whenever you're working out or you're at work and you need something in the background just to give you a little bit of motivation, whatever works for you. I also make music with Power Cycle. We have an album that is out that is also streaming everywhere. It is called Too Many Damn Cables. The entire album is improvised. We also have another EP coming out soon and a full album that will be coming out. So stay tuned for that. More Power Cycle stuff, even though we're not even in the same state right now. You can support this podcast by leaving comments and reviews and engaging and telling your friends about it. Let me know what you think about the people that I've had on lately and if you liked our conversations and stay tuned for even more exciting conversations that I'll be having with people in the future. I always end the podcast with my three things. They shape my life philosophy. Those three things are love never fails. It's going to be okay. I might be wrong.